Did you know, historically, people of color have been underrepresented in Intro to Psychology textbooks? This Black History Month, we'd like to share with you a brief history about important pioneers and other meaningful contributions to the field. Hello there, this is Bradley, and you're listening to Psych Everywhere, a podcast by Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. For this show, distinguished guests weigh in on applying psychological science to a diverse range of current events and to better your life. Would you prefer to read along as you listen? A written transcript is available. See the link in the show notes for this episode. Today, I have the honor of welcoming back to the show Dr. Rihanna Mason from the Urban Child Study Center at Georgia State University. You might remember her. A few years ago, she spoke with us about racist slurs that people use all too often. And that was actually one of our more popular episodes that year. Dr. Mason is an experimental psychologist with 20 plus years of social science research experience and five years of program evaluation. She manages projects related to the Georgia Department of Education, Rollins Center for Language and Literacy, and the Children's Museum of Atlanta. Research interests include vocabulary acquisition, early literacy development, and culturally relevant and equitable assessment. Related to today's topic, she's a co-editor of a book called Early Psychological Research Contributions from Women of Color, Volume 1, which contains 20 dissertations of cultural pioneers who were among the first to earn doctorate degrees in psychology. Dr. Mason has a very long history with Psychi. She supported the Psychi Inez Beverly Prosser Scholarship for Women of Color, which raised I think I'm right about this, something like $50,000, right? And then she promoted Psychi through the Southeastern Psychological Association and SIPO, which she was president of a few years back. She's on the Psychi Diversity Advisory Committee and has been for years, and she's published with Psychi several times too. Dr. Mason, welcome to Psych Everywhere. Thank you for having me back. I was really excited to have you back. I hadn't heard from you in a little while, and I the last conversation was so much fun. Um, so this time, we're, we're going to do the episode a little bit differently. A lot of the time, I do back and forth Q&A, but I've invited Dr. Mason to just sort of share a brief history of people of color in psychology. So I guess I'll let you take it from there. Sure. Thanks. So it's interesting. We're here in the month of February. um, And so we know that February has been associated with Black History Month. And so in addition to celebrating other persons of color, um, like American Indian, uh, Alaska Native, Asian American, Pacific Islander, um, and Hispanic or Latino, which those categories come from the the Census Bureau. We can focus, you know, solely on um, Black persons in psychology, a group with which I have the most affiliation with as a Black female psychologist. And so I think my identities and cultural heritage give me space to speak about um, this group. Um, I also think that oftentimes we focus on Blacks as a group or Black persons as a group because of the historical struggle um, and the period of enslavement in the United States. But it is true that there are other groups that are within the United States that have been historically marginalized um, have been underrepresented in science, in STEM, in the STEM workforce. And for that, it is notable um, to appreciate those other persons as well as they have helped to build the rich diversity of our field of psychology. Um, but I was happy to just think about who are 
the Black persons in psychology over time. So in the past and in the present. And I I really came up with a, a long list and it was complicated because you have to decide on what does it mean to be notable? I think a lot of times we focus on who's first, who was a pioneer or who was a trailblazer. But then there are other ways um, that you can um, be notable, um, like leading, building a department, um, having a significant leadership role, like leading a psychology organization, um, having your scholarship be cited. So who's the most prolific? Then there are those who are among a few. So there's only so many that look like them in a particular subdomain um, within psychology. Um, and then there are also power couples and power families. So I kind of just want to give a little brief overview of persons in those categories. So when we think about first, we think about Cecil Sumner the first African-American to earn a PhD. And we think about um, Inez Beverly Prosser, the first woman to earn a doctoral degree. But we also have Ruth Howard, who's noted as the first woman to earn her PhD in psychology. Um, and then when we think about um, pioneers and, and trailblazers, there's actually been a lot of recent writing about Pioneers and Trailblazers. There's a whole special issue of American psychologists that includes persons like um, Janet Helms, um, several industrial organizational psychologists like Jim Outs, Keisha Thomas. She's actually credited with the pet to threat theory, which people may not know about, but it has been brought back up, particularly because of what happened to Harvard's president. Claudine Gay. So her theory has now been used to talk about what's happening to Black women in leadership. Um, there's Patrick McKay, which is another um, industrial organizational psychologist. He was actually a SIOP fellow and then was awarded a fellowship through Association of Psychological um, Science. There are others who are, are notable um, trailblazers as well. Margaret Bill Spencer is also um, someone who developed the PVS theory, and she's in that special issue as well. Then when we think about who's most cited or most prolific, um, there actually used to be a ranking that you could find out about who this person was. Um, there were annual citation rankings of Black scholars in the social sciences. Um, I think that ranking stopped um, at some point. But if you just do a Google Scholar search and use the persons who were ranked previously, then you have Claude Steele, um, who's related to stereotype threat theory um, and also a Psychi Distinguished Member. Um with over 43,000 citations. You have Vonnie McLeod with over 30,000 citations. And then you also had Margaret Beale Spencer with 17,000 citations. You also have um, those who I would say are among a select few. Someone that I had chance to meet in my lifetime, Timothy Owens Moore, who's a physiological psychologist um, and co-founder of the Neuroscience Institute um, at the Atlanta University Center. Um, there are still, there's still underrepresentation of men in psychology and within um, physiological psychology. Um, there's also Charles Henry Turner, which I thought was Interesting. He fits the notion of early pioneer, but also a few to study insect behavior. And then Olivia Hooker um, is a woman who, you know, when looking over her history, if I would have had a chance to meet her, would have been 
um, very interesting to have a conversation. She was the only Black PhD in her class at the time at Rochester um, University. She worked with persons with developmental disabilities, and she's a survivor of the Tulsa Race Massacre in 1921. She was also the first African-American woman to enter the U.S. Coast Guard. So quite um, a bit of accomplishments. And then in our present day, there are persons like Dwayne Watson, who I've had a chance um, to meet as well, Ayanna Thomas, who noticed that there was underrepresentation in the psychonomic society, which um, is a society that I started um, attending when I was in graduate school. Um, they, among other persons of color, started the Spark Society. And the goal of the Spark Society is to create networks and promote professional development of historically excluded scholars who are African American, Black, Latina, or Latino, Native American, or of Native American heritage in cognitive psychology and the cognitive sciences. Then, lastly, another person who, um, again, if you had a chance to meet, Carlton Goodlett. He earned both a PhD and an MD, and he earned both before his 30th birthday. Um, he actually earned his doctorate degree in child psychology from the University of California, Berkeley at the age of 23. So um, quite someone that um, students can resonate with now, um, someone that you can think about if you're continuing in your graduate program, what's possible, not only finishing at an early age, but then completing two degrees. So let's switch to leaders. Leaders come in several types. Leaders come um, as creating organizations like Duane and Ayana. Leaders also come as um, leaders of site organizations or of colleges and universities. So just a couple of leaders who are present um, now in the last several year, presidents of the American Psychological Association. You have Tamer Bryant, Frank Worrell, Jennifer Kelly, Rosie Phillips Davis, and then the first, Jessica Henderson Daniel. And she was president in 2018. University presidents, um, you have one who also earned a Psychi presidential citation, Beverly Tatum, um, who was president emerita of Spelman College, my alma mater. But you also have Lily D. McNair, um, who was the eighth president of Tuskegee. She had also been at the University of Georgia as an associate professor and an associate director of the clinical psychology doctoral training program. She was the Department of Psychology's first African-American woman to obtain tenure and promotion. Robert Prentice Daniel became the president of Shaw University in North Carolina. Um, he was also the president of Virginia State College. And with those presidents, you hear something that is common among them. They were presidents of historically Black colleges and universities. So when we think about notable um, Black Americans in psychology or Black persons in psychology, training more than likely is going to lead you back to a historically Black college or university because they were the safe places that were established for us to attend college um, when other institutions of higher education um, were not admitting us as students. And so when we think about who was teaching there, you have a couple of examples. One, um, Maybelle Clater, who was at Morgan State University. And her story is, is interesting because you hear a lot about her husband but very little about her. Um, and so she was in the Department of Psychology at Morgan State. Um, she also was a Psychi chapter advisor. Her 
um, works within a department were notable enough that their current uh, research conference that they hold is named after her. Um, she had a hand in putting together the behavioral sciences uh, curriculum at Morgan State. She also had several publications that still help now or laid that foundation for um, certification requirements for public school psychologists, guidance counselors, teachers of children with special needs, and business educators. So recognizing someone like Maybell Clater, who helped to establish the psychology program at Morgan State University, is particularly relevant since there is a current Psychi vice president at Morgan State University. Her name is Ingrid Tullock. There are notable firsts within Psychi. And in fact, it hasn't been that long that Psychi has had a diversity director, but the first African American woman to become Psychi's diversity director is Dr. Gabrielle Smith. Um, and then to note, Cecil Sumner was also um, at Howard University, and, and Howard happens to be the first HBCU to establish a Psychi chapter. Howard is also notable because of a power couple that we um, often talk about, um, the Clarks. So, um, husband and wife team that we know, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, because of their um, doll study, their work has gone on to help with, you know, several pieces of legislation. They were active in the civil rights movement. Um, and then Kenneth Clark was the first black president of um, the American Psychological Association. So another leader in that regard. But there are other families. So we have A. Wade Boykin and C. Malik Boykin, um, which their history also ties you back to um, Howard. A. Wade Boykin was a professor at Howard, um, executive director of the Capstone Institute at Howard, and a co-director for the Center for Research on Education for Students Placed at Risk or CRESPAR. Um, his research was related to the interface of culture, context, motivation, and cognition. And then C. Malik Boykin um, is a social and organizational psychologist. He also spent two years at Brown as a fellow um, in cognitive, linguistic, and psychological sciences. But I think his mode of inquiry and his activism within the field follows suit from um, A. Wade Boykin or his father's um, research. Then we have Harriet and John Lewis McAdoo. Um, and even though John Lewis was a clinical social worker, we know that together they work um, to create a lot of scholarship around um, Black families. And so Harriet McAdoo is also featured in that special issue of American Psychologists as well. Well, I love that you emphasized power couples, you know, and then it kind of emphasizes the importance of family. I never would have thought to do it like that. Yeah, and who knows how many other either, you know, father, son, mother, daughter, or sibling pairs there are um, within the field. Um, and you're right. We don't see that um, published a lot. Um, who knows? I know that if you um, can do things together, um, you know, that's a great, great experience and a great way to show uh, legacy. So I tried to sort of highlight some of your achievements in the beginning of the episode, but when you were talking about how there were some psychologists that you wished you could talk to if they were still alive, it, it got me thinking, well, why don't we 
feature you a little bit here as well. Um, are there, is there anything that you would want people to know about you and your co- contributions? I think the first thing I like people to know about me is that I didn't always want to be a psychologist. I didn't have the privilege of having an AP psychology class when I was in high school. So I definitely did not have any posters of what a psychologist looked like or any exposure to books, even children's books. I know that Mamie Phipps Clark is in a um, children's book now, but at the time I didn't have any um, icons, notable icons who I could resonate with. And so um, I wanted to be an attorney when I came into college. So I enrolled at Spelman as a psychology pre-law major for two reasons. I wanted to stand up and defend others that, um, you know, had been struggling, but I also wanted to kind of change law in a way by knowing the minds of my clients. Well, it didn't take too long to discover that I was really more interested in learning about the minds of the client than advocating for the law. Um, I still think I have a bit of advocacy in my blood, but not from the attorney um, standpoint. I am grateful for the opportunity to be a beneficiary of training programs or academic um, pathway programs. So I participated in the National Institutes of Mental Health Careers and Opportunities for Research program starting in my junior year which allowed me to see different research labs. And I actually believe that's the time that I got to meet Dr. Moore for the first time. I can't quite remember where he was in his training, but um, he was at the Atlanta University Center at that time. He has remained there and has been chairperson of psychology at Clark Atlanta um, for quite some time. But um, seeing the different labs, gave me just an eye-opening experience about the breadth of what being a psychologist could be. I was fascinated by the tools and techniques. Um, The summer of my senior year, so transitioning between Spelman College and graduate school, I was able to go to NIH, um, spend time with Russian scientists there, Um, as part of NIDCD or the National Institutes of Deafness and Other Communication Disorders. We built our own electrode caps to do um, EEG recordings. And that was the time that I also learned how to collect data using functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, Now that has become a very popular tool, still hard data to collect for women in particular. You know, there's several things we have to consider before we can be um, used as participants. But I got to get in that scanner then to actually feel what it would be like for someone to go through the experiment that um, we created. A couple of other things, um, going to the University of South Carolina in Columbia. new to graduate school. In my family, both of my parents um, completed college. In fact, they both went on to medical school, but no one at the time had gone through graduate school. The training is different. And I was also pushed very hard to pursue a medical career. So the highlight about the MD, PhD was someone that I wish that I had known about because perhaps I would have persisted to earn two degrees and made my parents happy at the time. Um, But pursued a degree in experimental psychology. So I got to work with another tool, um, learned how to record eye movements. Um, and then was very interested in whether or not subgroups mattered as far as reading. A lot of the literature didn't really pay attention to subgroups at the time other than age. Um, but race or ethnicity was not a variable that was, um, explored. I think in some of the early work, um, 
early 1900s, there may have been a distinction between white and black readers. But then at the time that the data was collected, the influence on race and ethnicity on reading was also confounded with our access to books and access to schools. So looking to see if those two groups were different as far as speed of reading or um, strategies in reading would not have been um, a clear, there wouldn't have been a clear answer as to why. Um, And it's still common today. We see a lot of um, comparisons that lead to maybe not as much as or different than um, and unpacking those differences or reasons why numbers differ um, is very complex. So I got um, a taste of trying to do that um, in graduate school. Um, The other thing I think that's notable, I had a chance to do a postdoc at Florida State University um, and had freedom to then explore more within the communication sciences. Um, Another degree pathway that psychology dovetails nicely with, um, we use corresponding methods and assessments. um, So when you work across um, disciplinary teams, you often uh, within developmental or cognitive may also see speech language pathologists. So um, having that opportunity. The other notable accomplishments, I am a book author. Um, you mentioned one in the intro. Um, I also was able to pair with my mentor, Cherry Collier, who's also a Spelman alum. She's also an industrial organizational psychologist, Um, but we were able to adapt her original publication about careers in psychology um, to be used at Emanuel College, where I was um, an associate professor. So we use that as a guidebook for our uh, seniors and gave them um, information about preparing their career pathways. Um, so a lot of team collaboration for authorship, in addition to the um, book about um, women of color in psychology, which also has the second volume that's completed now too. So um, I think lastly, since we talked about legacy, um, I'm fortunate to have the um, chance to have gone to school at the same institution as two family members. So my mother is a, um, or was a Spelman alum, class of 72, but also I have a cousin um, who graduated um, from the psychology department. And I currently have her daughter, who is um, now a junior at Spelman, also going through the psychology department. So I find that as both notable, but um, fortunate to have that that legacy going on. Um, had the opportunity to co-author with my cousin also, Natalie Haslam Lattimore. So um, she is both um, counseling psychologist, but also a nurse practitioner. So diversity in how we're using our degrees, but... Um, fortunate to share the same undergraduate training. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I really liked um, kind of how you talked about your journey to even becoming a psychologist. I think it's easy for me to be talking to a psychologist and really not be thinking about the fact that you weren't always one. And I think just you kind of letting people know about these different pathways you know, and, and I think just by you saying that helps to kind of help people navigate imposter syndrome and things like that and help them realize that, they, you know, if you broaden your horizons and you get to looking around, you never know all the unique connections and, and resources you might find out there to help you find a career that's just right for you. So, yeah, thank you so much. And for that amazing history of people of color and psychology. Thanks again for having me back. Um, to talk on the podcast, and it it was a joy going down memory lane, both 
for um, historically for persons in the field, but also through my journey as well. You've just listened to another episode of Psych Everywhere. I hope that this episode has provided you with some new insights into the history of psychology. If you'd like to learn more, be sure to go check out Psychi's Black History Month online resource. This resource contains educational content, information about diversity-related awards that are provided by Psychi, and it lists black psychologists to remember. Go check out the resource and see how many of the names you recognize and be sure to learn about the rest. So that resource is at www.psychi, which is spelled P-S-I-C-H-I dot O-R-G slash Black History Month. If you haven't already subscribed to Psych Everywhere, go ahead and follow us wherever you go for podcast. Tell a friend or a colleague about the show. Word of mouth is a huge help for podcasts. So, share what you learned at the dinner table or in your classes. You can also follow us on Twitter at Psychi Podcast and leave a review at Apple Podcast or wherever you go for podcast. You'll absolutely make my day. And more importantly, you'll be helping us to get psych everywhere. Okay, that's all for now. I'll connect with you again soon. Copyright 2024, Psychi the International Honor Society in Psychology. All rights reserved.